Studios, the AusBiz COV is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Hi there, welcome to the COB. It is a Friday and it's nice to be on a Friday. I'm Nadine Blaney. And I'm Juliette Sali. And of course, we are seeing a pretty good end to the week and a very good rally over the week. I think we're up by about one and a half percent. Yeah, I think so. And today, a lot of the enthusiasm, as far as I saw, was put down to sort of a turn that we saw in commodity markets. In particular, we saw a lot of enthusiasm coming through in the iron ore price. Um, we've seen you know, really strong export data and hopes for sustained demand, I think moving that market along and that is good for some of our biggest sectors of course. Yeah a lot of movement of course in energy which we're going to talk to but lithium as well and I was talking about that with David Lane from Audmanet. Finally some of those lithium players getting the love that perhaps many in the market think that they do deserve. I think you've got Pilbara up by some five percent but of course it really is about this energy potential M&A. Are we going to see an 80 billion dollar fossil fuel giant created if Woodside and Santos uh, do in fact join together? So the themes are We've got this rally on a positive week, even with big data looming in the United States. We've got Woodside, Santos. Santos actually was the real beneficiary in terms of the share price today. Yeah, it makes you think whether or not Woodside shareholders don't really believe in it because they were down from the open and they're now off by about half of 1%. Yeah, and I suppose that it's the Santos share price that has really been depressed at CEO Kevin Gallagher, you know, reiterating time and time again that it's not reflecting sort of the fundamentals or, you know, even the energy price that they've been obtaining. So that was actually the stock of the day. We'll get there in just a little bit. And then we've got uh, this revamped RBA. So uh, when it comes to the RBA, we know that there's been a lot of um, you know, movement happening in terms of its mandate, in terms of how it will function going forward. And it looks as if uh, we've got some of that detail coming through today. Yeah, indeed. And of course, we saw yesterday as well, the new RBA assistant governor outsider, Sarah Hunter. So of course, a lot happening at the central bank as they're about to take quite a bit of a, a pause as well. We won't hear from them until February in terms of any further interest rate decision. But of course, this week, we did have that interest rate decision on hold at 4.35%. Uh, the dollar is actually an interesting one. So we've got the Aussie and New Zealand dollar extending their losses, particularly versus the yen. Of course, that really upset the Apple Corps when we heard from uh, Bank of Japan a officials talking about potentially or at least the market interpreted it yeah. as potentially an end to negative rates there in Japan. So one to watch, but also CBA put out a note this morning calling for further pressure to come through on the Australian dollar. Um, really, they're talking about, you know, global slowdown. Uh, the Aussie dollar is a risk currency. And of course, they put out a pretty detailed note just comparing it on the crosses. So interesting to keep that in mind. But um, yeah, sector wise, energy in focus. Absolutely. Let's have a look at those energy players. We've been talking about Woodside and Santos. Woodside ending down about half of 1%. I mean, given that it fell quite significantly on the open, that's not too bad. Santos, though, is certainly in focus here, up by almost 6%. It is slightly smaller as well than Woodside. So is it going to gain more from this potential merger? You've got Woodside worth some 50 billion and Santos worth about 25 or so. Ampol off by four tenths of 1%. Beach Energy looking good on the close. So here we go. Let's look at the big miners to see how uh, yeah that enthusiasm over iron ore has expressed itself for BHP and Rio in particular really got to change that new crest mining on there yeah. and Fortescue is up by one and a half percent tech in the US did well to, uh, overnight yeah absolutely this new AI Gemini coming through of course from Alphabet Google's parent wise tech global down 2.6 percent zero looking good though one of the beneficiaries so we didn't really take that positive lead from the Nasdaq today a bit of a sell down in some of these players and of course as we were talking earlier I think Heath Moss was saying it to me from HLM investments you know we're not quite as leveraged yet on that AI space as the US. Okay, corporate stories. Look, um, obviously, it was Santos and Woodside that really stole all the headlines. Sky City actually downgraded. That's off by 3%. Washington H sold Pats. One of the big stories of the week, you know, making that bid for perpetual. Uh, Lake Resources, I see that there was a CFO that has been announced, but um, I think it's a continuation of just some of the M&A that's happening in this space. I think that might have been a broker move as well um, on that one. But uh, let's move on to Sky City Entertainment. It did lower its revenue guidance due to weaker gaming gains in New Zealand and a softer performance in Adelaide. So that's kind of behind its 3% fall today. All right. So we did foreshadow that we've got um, Woodside Energy and Santos, couple of stocks of the day. Let's find out what our expert guests had to say. Now, normally they're small cappy guys, but we did hear from Luke Winchester and Claude Walker from A Rich Life.
few months ago, and there were predictions that oil was going to stay above $100, $110 a barrel um, because of the the dynamics of, of the industry and what OPEC was doing. And here we are, you know, uh, a couple of months later, and the plot, the price has slid, and now people are, you know, uh, forecasting it could go to fifty dollars. Like that's that's the issue I have, and so it's it's the main problem with these businesses. And the other one as well, which again, uh, the Santos CEO was flagging, is that they're intensively, um, oh sorry, you know, excessively capital intensive. Um, and so he was calling out that you know being that bigger business as a merged entity, um, the balance sheets can obviously fund that capital intensity a lot easier. So. Not for me, but again, if you're there, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't take any action on this today and, and wait and see how it all plays out. If indeed we're going to get four, seven rate cuts or something coming up, which I, I struggle to believe, I'm not sure what the time frame on that was, but that would imply a slowing economy, which is hardly going to be great for them. So yeah, it, o- overall, uh, I w- wouldn't find them that attractive right now, but I do think that these kind of businesses can make sense for uh, somebody who acknowledges the cycle, but I think you probably got to try and time the cycle, and it wouldn't seem that favourable to me at the moment. All right, let's have a look at the week ahead uh, while we wait for our esteemed guest, Shane Oliver. And uh, I just mentioned we're not going to hear from the RBA till February. I meant in terms of the meeting. We will hear from Governor Bullock speaking next week. Uh, also some, uh, I guess, pulse reads on the economy and what Michelle Bullock and co are going to look at. Consumer confidence for December, the NAB business survey and the RBA minutes, Nadine, from this meeting, which many did indicate were perhaps a little on the on the more dovish side. Yeah, um, when it comes to consumer confidence, we, we do do know that consumers are pretty gloomy. Those interest rate hikes are starting to bite. We did have some data coming through this week showing that, you know, a lot of Aussies are really eating into their savings buffers that were built up. You know, we're being taxed a lot. And when it comes to that uh, NAB business survey, conditions have been holding up quite well. So this will be the read on November. Uh, it will be interesting to see if we get any insight into the jobs market, employment, because of course we are learning that job ads are rising. So yeah, there's a lot of data. And when you consider that this is what we learned this week yet again, a very data dependent uh, RBA, it's going to be an interesting one, but that's just what's happening here locally. Don't forget, we've got the FOMC. We've got, um, we've also got the BOE. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of data that's coming through in terms of central bank action uh, from the Eurozone, from Switzerland, from Norway, and from Sweden as well. Yeah, indeed. So that's up on your screen now, of course, the Fed decision, consumer prices, retail sales and non-farm payrolls, which are tonight, right, in the US. So that's the the key one. And uh, Chinese monthly indicators as well. I was just talking to Daniel Hines there about the impact of uh, China and particularly on a lot of our commodities, which we've seen in this continued ratchet higher in iron. All worth noting out that the Singapore contract hit uh, well, not at record, but its highest level for, for 2023 today. And that's just surprised so many when you think that Goldman Sachs called for that bear market back in August. And we've continued to see such a ratchet higher coming through from those iron ore prices and those uh, iron ore players as well. Fortescue above $25. And Gemma Dale from NAB Trade was telling me earlier um, that that's one stock that they sort of see a lot of people potentially wanting to sell around 25 But you've still got so much momentum uh, in terms of what you've seen with that uh, price. All right, let's get to our guest. Our guest, it's a Friday. A very warm welcome to Shane Oliver, AMP Chief Economist. Shane, welcome. Hey, if we start with equities, uh, positive week overall. So what were the big drivers from where you sit? Well, globally, it was pretty mixed. Uh, The US is down a bit. Uh, Europe's up quite a bit. Uh, and of course, Australia's up uh, pretty well as well. Um, I think there's a bit of catch up going on here. It, it's finally dawning on the market that the RBA probably won't be raising interest rates again. There's still a risk there. It's a high risk. Uh, and the market's actually uh, now completely priced out any chance of a, of a hike when I last looked earlier this morning and actually factored in the start of cuts in the second half of next year. So that seems to have been the main factor. Uh, helping our market. Of course, in some ways, it sounds perverse because we did see some weaker uh, than expected economic data from GDP. But the clear message is that RBA rate cuts, rate hikes rather, are working to slow the consumer. And that, I think, is what the market's latched on to. Similar story, of course, in in Europe with uh, 
ECB now sounding quite uh, dovish, or some officials at the ECB sounding quite dovish previously, hawkish official, officials. And so consequently, we've seen bonds continue to rally. We've seen, uh, or generally, Japan's an exception to that, but generally bond yields continued to fall. And of course, um, we've also seen the Aussie dollar pull back a little bit, but not, not, a, not a lot in that. In fact, this afternoon, it seems to be on the rise again. Uh, Shane, I'm just looking at one of your charts on the seasonal pattern in shares. We always talk about this elusive Santa Claus rally. I mean, it's interesting that most of the the gains over the year have come really just in the last week or so for our market. They certainly have. We we spent a lot of time bouncing around this year. I mean, it's interesting when you look at that pattern there and if you convert it into a seasonal index, the US share market's followed it almost precisely it started the year off quite strong. It had weakness into February. Then it had a rally into July, then topped out, then had three months of falls into October, and then a rip-roaring rally in November. Now, to some degree, we've been affected by that along the way, but we've been a relative laggard. So US share market, I, I think, is up something like 18% year to date, and NASDAQ is up something like 35% on the back of the AI boom. Uh, we've been a relative laggard. We don't have the tech stocks Uh, to the same degree as the US. And of course, there's been these worries about China and the Australian consumer on the back of high interest rates. But nevertheless, if an investor, if the market were to end where it is today, uh, an Australian investor would still get 6% maybe with franking credits or thereabouts. And if you're well diversified and got some global shares in there, uh, you'd get 20% out of them. So all up, you know, you would have done pretty well. So Shane, One of the big narratives this week has been rate cuts. Rate cuts coming through. Everybody's got their idea of when they will come through in FY24. And you can talk here locally or, you know, in the U.S., which is, of course, dictating a lot of the movement. I mean, what's your sense? Is it just too soon? You know, that would imply, you know, a lot, right? Just in the fact that we'd have rate cuts coming early, uh, relatively speaking, next year. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I, I have a feeling the markets have gotten ahead of themselves, but ultimately they'll probably be proven to be right, just as they were to some degree going back a couple of years ago when markets started to sniff out rate hikes. Uh, central banks may not be comfortable to the degree to which rate cuts are being priced in. I think there's something like 5.25% cuts or just over that priced into the US uh, uh, money market uh, next year. Um, starting, I think, in the the June quarter. So that that may be too much for the Fed. If you go back to the last dot plot and uh, scratch out the last hike that they'd penciled in for December, scratch that one out, then the dot plot was only implying one uh, rate cut through the course of uh, 2024. Uh, they may revise that next week uh, when they meet, but it's probably still only going to show maybe two cuts for 2024. So you might see some pushback against uh, the rapid moves by the money markets. But by the same token, I, I, th- I think the money markets could ultimately prove, be proven to be right. Um, at least they've got the direction right here, I think. But uh, yeah, there's going to be a bit of give and take there about the magnitude and the timing. The US jobs report, of course, in focus. I know you've got a chart as well on, on some of the moves that we've been seeing in jobs. Uh, what should we be looking out for? And I guess the overall picture here for the Fed. Well, the, I mean, next week is a, literally an avalanche of central bank meetings. Uh, yeah, the Fed's the big one there. The Fed will be pleased with that chart there, be, particularly the job openings to unemployment rate ratio. And you can see that it's coming down quite rapidly. It's almost back to where it was in 2018, 2019. But there is quite a close correlation between that that blue line and wages growth in the US. And it's consistent with a further deceleration in wages growth particularly on the the broader employment cost index. So that'd be something that pleases the Fed. The Fed I think the Fed also likes the fact that inflation is coming down. The, the core PCE is now running below uh, levels that the Fed was forecasting for the end of the year. Uh, and in fact, if you look at the last six months, I think it's been running at something like 1% on an annualised basis or something of that order. So the Fed will be, be quite happy with that. But it, it, it probably doesn't want to get too excited at this stage. So I, I suspect there might be some pushback against uh, money market expectations. So next week is probably, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't surprise me if investors are a bit cautious going into the Fed meeting and also into the uh, the other central bank meetings. So just in keeping with um, our previous conversation, I just got a note into my inbox saying that the RBA will start cutting rates as early as Q2 2024. 
Is part of that, you know, some of the data that we got in terms of the GDP this week, particularly the consumer, do you think that's why we're seeing those calls? That's right. I, I think, uh, you know, our view, I mean, we were sort of thinking initially that it would be February, but that's uh, probably a bit too early uh, now. And then we pushed it out to the middle of the year and then currently thinking um, maybe not Q2, but I, I think certainly Q3 and, and the June, meeting, June is certainly possible. Um, but they, uh, they, they do meet in mid-June, so they have a meeting in May, the start of May, first Tuesday in May, then mid-June. Um, so it's possible they could go then, I think more likely the second in, into the September quarter. Uh, I mean, if you look at that chart there, it shows the, the slump in per capita GDP and our forecast going forward. So that per capita GDP recession will continue to get worse from here. A big part of that is the slump in the consumer. You know, the, uh, the rate hikes were aimed at slowing consumer spending. Obviously, some consumers, they hit a lot harder than others. So there's all sorts of issues around that, but they wanted to slow things down. We're now seeing that. Consumer spending for the year to uh, September quarter was 0.4%. Population growth was about 2.4%. So real consumer spending has gone backwards already to the tune of, tune of about 2% uh, so per person, that is. So we're seeing quite a um, significant hit there. And I think it will only get worse. If you look at the October household spending survey, which came out from the ABS on Tuesday, uh, it shows a further deceleration and the consumer spending uh, probably went negative, not just on per capita basis, but an uh, overall basis went negative in the uh, in the December quarter, the current quarter. Uh, and you know, obviously households are continuing to run down their savings. We've got a very low household savings rate now. Uh, for the bottom 40% of households, I suspect by early next year, their savings buffers will have uh, run out. Uh, and that means uh, big cutbacks in spending, further big cutbacks in spending. So, so that's sort of what's driving this thinking about rate cuts uh, coming through next year. And um, I, I, I think that's probably the direction we're heading. Now, of course, you say, well, inflation's still too high, five uh, percent. Uh, elsewhere, it's three or something. You know, we're the odd one out. Well, just bear in mind that go back a year ago, uh, what well, we ultimately got to. Eight, but at this point in time, the data we had at the time was around six and a half or something, whereas the, the Europeans were around ten or eleven. The UK was around eleven, and of course, um, the US was just coming down from nine. Uh, so we are lagging these other countries. We lagged on the way up. We're now lagging on the way down. But the fact that they're coming down tells me we are going to see further falls here in Australia. And I wouldn't mind betting by the end of this year that headline monthly inflation uh, annual rate will be. Uh, with a three in some, uh, in, a three in front of it by the end of the year. Now, Shane, I'm late to this party because I haven't spoken with you lately. <laughs> but I understand there's a little bit of a Friday book club going on here. I would, I'd love to partake. <laughs> what, what, what's what, are you reading, what are you listening to? Yeah. Well, uh, I'm still reading that uh, that rather lengthy uh, fantasy novel, The Time of Courage, that I, I referred to earlier. But, but as I mentioned, I often have two books going at once. Um, lately, I've decided to reread this, Aww. which may sound a bit right wing. Uh, you may recall Milton Friedman was a classic US economist, very popular in the well, 70s and 80s. Uh, he was the guy who did all the work on you know, what drove the US depression and all those sorts of things. Um, but as we went through the the, the, the 80s, uh, there was a dis disenchantment at the time with, I guess, what he calls collectivist solutions, government solutions to everything. And, of course, uh, Ronald Reagan rode on the back of that to government uh, in 1980, I think it was, took over in 81. And, of course, Thatcher in 79. And in, and in Australia, you could argue that Talk and Keating ultimately adopted their sort of supply-side policies so this book is about free to free to choose. It's it's about the uh, the uh, the underpinnings of successful economics from from personal freedom, and that it leads to better economic outcomes. So I, I, I sort of thought I should reread this because you know these days there's a lot of popularity with government solutions to everything, and of course the pandemic took that to an extreme where we're all protected through the pandemic. Mm. Um, those of us who need protecting by government uh, measures. And there's always a danger that goes to an extreme and we end up with another swing eventually back the other way as people realise that government can't solve everything. And Friedman, I think, gives a lot of insights into this sort of thing. The other thing in this little book is a bit on uh, bracket creep. 
And there's a chart in my weekly today, I don't know if you've got a version you can put up there, which shows tax paid as a share of household income, depending on whether you use gross income or gross, gross disposable income. For households, it's at a record high. Yeah, you know, we thought the GST was meant to fix that one up, but uh, over the last couple of years, the share of average household income going to uh, the tax man has gone up by five percentage points. Uh, and part of that is bracket creep. It's it's a form of stealth tax hikes. And Friedman actually refers to that in his book. Um, and that uh, governments say, well, we've been cutting taxes, we've been cutting taxes. But when you look at the actual share of GDP, share of income going to taxes, it's been rising over time. Yeah. And that's certainly what we're seeing for Australian households right now. So it's a little wonder that people are cutting back. They're paying more to the tax man, more in bank interest, not as much left over to go and spend. We didn't get that chart out. Productivity issues here. I'm joking. We've all been working very hard. We just couldn't <laughs> get that one. But Shane, thank you so much and have Not a great tomorrow. weekend. Shane Oliver thank from you. AMP. Let's have a look at the afterclose leaders and laggards. Yeah, so Pilbara is on there. It has um, obviously got a lot of attention because of the amount of shorts. Well, it has its price target lifted 16% to $2.85 per share by Morgan Stanley today. I'm not seeing any news associated with Sayona Mining or Alchem. And then we did mention Liontown before. Um, Look, there you go. <laughs> they yeah. are your leaders, no matter the reason. Indeed, and I think Oldcombe, Liontown, Pilbara, it was all just based on that that big rise that you saw in iron ore futures in Singapore. Let's have a look at uh, what we're seeing with the laggards. Uh, Emerald Resources down 5%, Telix Pharmaceuticals off by 2.6%. And uh, we talked about Sky City and also Star Entertainment in the news as well, off by 2.8%. Interesting, as we talked about before, these tech stocks didn't really take the, the lead Yeah, Yeah, no. It is really interesting. Um, Technology One, you know, one of the very quality companies. We've got uh, some market talk that Wise Tech could upgrade its cost out targets, but not enough to help move these ones along. And I had a look at these small cap laggards and leaders earlier. And again, I didn't see a lot associated with it. Of course, Appen has been absolutely hammered. Uh, look to raise capital once again. Uh, lithium seems to be a theme of the day, so that probably explains Arizona Lithium. And on the flip side of things, um, if anything, well, not much has changed since about 2.30, but uh, uranium, elevate uranium at least, down by 16%. All right, and we went through what to happen, what will happen <laughs> next week. Um, of course, we're winding down into the year, but for the day today, a positive session on the back of those lithium moves, on the back of iron ore and Santos, and we're closing high by half of one percent there on the SIBO 200. I think the ASX 200 a little bit uh, slower. Yeah, a bit, bit more muted. But after the day's trades went through, we've got uh, three tenths of a percent under our belt. Look, when you consider everything that's going on, and uh, not bad up by one. 1.7% for the week. Just a quick check in on US futures. Now a little bit mixed, um, but still a lot of water to go under the bridge. European session, take us to New York when we will have jobs, of course. All right, we will see you next week. Of course, you can catch up with all our interviews, osbiz.com.au. Um, we were talking about what our favourites were this week. I think mine was the Nickel Industries guy. That was really interesting. They've got this target for 2030 and 2050 and the green, clean energy in Indonesia, which is not a place that you generally mm. think about. Green, and the Chinese energy. backers there at COP24. Look, yeah. I've been enjoying the Osbiz advent calendar. We'll continue <laughs> to publish them over the weekend. And we look forward to seeing you next week. All right, see you then.